All right, question 41. Which of the following is the least likely a category into which a firm reporting under the IFRS framework could put dividend payments? Operating activities, investing activities, or C, operating and financing activities. So dividend payments are considered a, can be considered a financing activity um, because they're a distribution of profits to shareholders, which has an effect on the company's equity. Um, but they can also be considered an operating activity um, because they're a regular part of the company's operations. If they typically pay out a quarterly dividend, then it's, um, you know, companies don't typically like to cut dividends. So it just becomes a part of um, needing to make that expense for operations. So that said, we're going for least likely. We can uh, consider operating and um for both of those and financing, but they cannot be uh, considered part of investing activities. B. Question 42. In an economy in a period of inflation, which of the following methods will most likely produce a higher debt to equity ratio? Um, last in, first out, first in, first out, or the inventory valuation methodology will not affect the debt to equity ratio. So we, we'll go ahead and cross off C right away. It's going to have an effect because we're in a period of inflation. That means that our inventory costs have been, um, will have been increasing over time. So what we're keeping on our books um, is going to matter. So for last in first out method, this essentially means that the inventory that we bought over here, so last, is going to be um, what... Um, is going to be what flows through to the income statement. So there's kind of two different ways to look at this. So from a LIFO standpoint, um, we're gonna be selling our inventory up here. From FIFO, we're gonna be selling this. So on the income statement for LIFO, we're gonna have a higher um, cost of goods sold. And essentially that's gonna leave a lower inventory amount on the balance sheet. And if we have a lower inventory amount on the balance sheet, we're gonna have a lower asset amount. And if we have a lower asset amount, that doesn't change the debt at all. So if we have a lower asset amount, that means we need to have a lower equity amount to balance off that debt. So we're gonna have a lower equity amount relative to the debt, which means we'll have a higher debt to equity ratio under last in uh, first out. So that's kind of one way to reason it. Um, the other way is, um, under the LIFO method, we're selling the more recently higher cost goods um, first. This is going to result in the higher cost goods sold, which then reduces net income. And then that also flows through to the retained earnings. Um, so retained earnings falls under equity. So if we have lower net income, we're having lower retained earnings, which is under the equity. So again, we're going to have lower equity relative to the debt. Um, so just another way to kind of get to that answer, but essentially it falls into debt stays the same. And then under LIFO, we either have lower equity or lower assets um, or both, I guess. Answer A. Question 43. An analyst has gathered the following information on a small cap firm for May 2016. Opening inventory of 2 million, closing inventory of 3 million, and cost of sales of 10 million. Given the information, the inventory turnover ratio is closest to so our inventory turnover is going to be cost of goods sold divided by average inventory over the period. Average inventory is going to be open inventory plus closing inventory divided by 2. So that would be 2.5. So we'll have 10 in the numerator here. 2.5 in the denominator gives us inventory turnover of 4. Answer B. Question 44. In which step of the financial statement analysis framework would an analyst most likely utilize regression analysis? So we've got A, process data, B, analyze and interpret the data, or C, develop, communicate, uh, develop and communicate conclusions and recommendations. Um, so I think we can go ahead right away and cross off C. This is going to be the last step in that process. And so we'll like, we're going to be far past the um, regression analysis because we're already developing conclusions based on that regression analysis. So looking at A and B here, um, these are kind of ordered. So we've got this is a first step, second step, and third step. And this might not be the exact steps, but that's kind of the general 
flow of these answers. So processing the data, um, in this step, this is where we'll be using uh, various tools to kind of analyze and um, manipulate and kind of organize collected data. Um, this might involve um, computing financial ratios, preparing the financial statements how we want them to, and likely performing some type of regression analysis just to understand how the different variables are interacting with one another. Um, so this is going to be our answer, and then we can kind of also get to that by B. This is going to be past the regression part. Um, if we're analyzing and interpreting the data, we're kind of analyzing the output of that regression at this step. So we can cross that off, stick with answer A. Um, we're going to be using regression most likely during that processing data part. Question 45. Which of the following statements is most likely correct? The activity ratio. A, indicates how efficiently a company performs its day-to-day -day tasks. So right off the bat, this looks like it's going to be our answer. Activity ratio is a financial metric that's used to determine how efficiently a company is converting its assets into cash or sales, um, which is an indication of the day-to-day -day efficiency of those tasks. To make sure we can rule out B and C, B is not relevant for a financial statement analysis as it indicates the operational efficiency. Um, it's definitely relevant because operational efficiency um, flows through to the financial statements. If we're more efficient, that's going to show up in those financial statements. So we can go ahead and get rid of B. C, measure these, the quantity of an asset or flow that is associated with the ownership of a specified claim. Um, so what this is referring to is going to fall under like valuation ratios, so like price to earnings ratio or price to book. Um, which are kind of indications of that ownership of specified claim, um, but not necessarily the activity ratio. So we can cross off C as well, and we'll stick with answer A. Question 46. Turks & Company is a glass manufacturing firm whose income statement is being analyzed by an analyst at a local credit rating firm. Some relevant accounts for the year 2016 have been given in the following table. So we've got the income statement um, and a bunch of information here. Let's read our question before we kind of go through this information. Using the given data, the fixed charge coverage ratio of the firm is closest to. All right, so I'm going to pull in that fixed charge coverage ratio formula. Uh, I'll put it up here. Um, so we've got EBIT plus fixed charges before tax um, over interest payments divided by fixed charges before tax. Um, so looking at this here, our EBIT, that is going to be our given to us right here, 6,800. So that makes that nice and easy. And then our interest payments is also given um, uh, right here at 250. The fixed charges before tax um, is a little more difficult, but essentially um, that is going to be our lease payments. And if we just look at these, like depreciation is not a fixed charge, SGNA is not a fixed charge, lease payments are. Um, so we can uh, include that in those fixed charges. And then when we calculate that out, here's what that looks like. So we've got that 6,800 plus 350 over 350 plus 250 gives us 11.92, corresponds with answer A. Question 47. Which of the following statements is or are most accurate regarding the common size analysis of financial statements? So for common sizing financial um, statements, just as a reminder, we're basically going to be choosing something on the balance sheet or income statement, and then we're going to be making everything a percentage of that. So we're typically going to be using um, a, depending on vertical or horizontal, we'll be using a key metric like revenue or assets and then kind of... Um, making everything else a percentage of that so that uh, you can kind of compare across industries a little easier with percentages than you can with overall numbers. Um, so we'll look at these three statements and then we need to determine which of them are accurate. So we've got two, two and three, or one and three. So let's look at statement one. A vertical common size balance sheet presents all line items as a percentage of total assets. That is true, um, so statement one is accurate. Um, two, a vertical common size income statement presents all the line items as a percentage of net income. So this one's not gonna be true. We're gonna be using revenue rather than net income. 
um, for a vertical common size income statement. Um, and then three, a horizontal common size income statement calculates all the line items as a percentage of the base year's income. This is also going to be true. Um, so we can conclude that one and three are good. We'll go with answer C. Uh, B has two and three and A has two. Um, answer C. Question 48. A hypothetical firm operating under IFRS leased equipment for five years with a finance lease that requires annual payments of $20,000 at the interest rate of 7%. The lease schedule is given in the following table. Uh, using the above mentioned assumptions, which of the following best describes the impact on the cash flow statement of the lessee in the first year? So our lessee is the person taking out, taking on the lease, so they'll be making the payments. Um, so let's look at these answers here. So we've got A, cash outflow of 14260 from operating activities and a cash inflow of 5740 from financing activities. So right away, we've got a cash inflow. Um, we're the ones making the payment, so I think we can go ahead and rule this out right away. When we're um, financing a lease, we're not really gonna have any cash coming in. We're the one paying the lease. Um, so we can cross off A. B, cash inflow. So we've got that again there. I think we can probably go ahead and cross that off of 5740 from operating activities and cash outflow of 14260 from financing activities. So we're going to cross that off as well. Make sure we can go with C. C, cash outflow of 5740 from operating activities and cash outflow of 14260 from financing activities. So that sounds more accurate from the inflow outflow standpoint. Let's just um, verify though, so where we're going to put it under. So that 5740 number, this is coming from our interest expense. So the interest portion is going to go under operating expenses. So that's what we have here. Interest expense going under operating. And then the cash outflow of 14260, which is just going to be um, our lease payment minus the interest expense. This is going to be the principal portion of the payment. And that's going to go under financing activities. And the reason that goes under financing activities is because when we're paying back some of the principal, this is going to reduce our liability over time. So the interest goes towards operating, principal portion goes towards financing. And they're both cash outflows. Answer C. Question 49. An analyst gathered the following data on YMU Corp for the year 2018. We've got free cash flow to the firm of 90 million, net income of 80, depreciation of 30, capex of 20, tax rate, and no change in working capital. For the year 2018, the interest expense is closest to. So we're not given interest expense, but we're given a lot of other numbers here. So I think we can get to the interest expense by um, working through this. So I'm going to pull in all the work here, and then we'll walk through it. Um, so we're going to start with free cash flow to the firm. Sorry, let me just get all these in here. So we're going to start with free cash flow to the firm as our formula. And free cash flow to the firm is going to equal net income, which is our 80 million plus non-cash expenditures um, plus interest expense times tax rate minus fixed, in fixed investment. And the fixed investment um, is going to be our capex in this instance. So what we need to do to calculate interest expense, we just need to rearrange this formula. So we bring um, the... Um, we bring net income over here, we bring non-cash expenditures over here, we bring fixed, fixed investment over here, and then divide by the tax rate gives us this formula. And then from here, we can just plug and play all those numbers. So we've got free cash flow to the firm of 90 million, and then we're gonna subtract out the net income of 80 million, um, subtract out that depreciation of 30, uh, which is our non-cash expenditure, and then 20, dollar um, add back of the capex divide that by one minus the tax rate it gives us um, zero and when you divide anything else by divide anything by zero it's gonna be zero so we go with answer a question 50 for the past year firm X an Australian high-tech firm that follows IFRS has spent $5 million on research costs and $5 million on development costs on a staff management software whose feasibility has been established. 
Firm Z, an American space tech firm that reports under U.S. GAAP, is in the early stages of a similar um, who's complete a similar project whose completion is still in question, but the firm has also spent $5 million on research costs and $5 million on development costs over the same period. If both firms had had this, have had the same revenue, which firm will most likely report the highest net income? So the keys that we're looking at here, we've got one firm under IFRS and one under GAAP, and they have the same research costs, same development costs, same revenue. Um, so what this question is really asking is who's going to have higher net income and it's going to be based on the treatment of research and development costs. So under IFRS on GAAP, the first cost is research. Under IFRS and GAAP, both are going to um, expense research as we go, as, sorry, expense research as costs. Um, whereas the difference is going to come in on those development costs. So for GAP, development costs are going to need to be expensed as incurred as well. But under IFRS, if once we have feasibility, they can then capitalize that cost. And what capitalizing the cost does is it allows them to realize that over time. So essentially, if they're able to realize this $5 million over time, they're going to have higher earnings in the current period relative to the U.S. company that needs to realize this $5 million now. So basically what this is going to lead us to is Firm X is going to have um, higher net income than Firm Z. So let's see if we have that answer. Firm X will report higher net income than Firm Z. There we go. Correct. Um, firm Z will report higher net income than Firm X. Nope. And firm X and Z will have, will report the same net income. Also, no. So C would be correct if we didn't have this feasibility um, in place. So the feasibility is the key thing there on IFRS for capitalizing those um, development costs. Answer A.